Try to gather your thoughts, gather your attention right here, right now. So it's just your awareness, your body, the feeling of the breath coming in and going out. Notice where you feel the breath. And notice how it feels. You can try some long breathing to start out with. And if long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it doesn't, you can change. Make it shorter, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. Try to find what rhythm and texture breathing feels good for the body and is easy for the mind to keep track of. Because that's one of the functions of right mindfulness is keeping track of one thing, making that your focal point. Focal in the sense that you don't want to get involved in other topics, you want to be with this one. But think of it as a broad focus. You're aware of the whole body. The breath may be more prominent in one part than the other, but you're aware of it. the fact that it can be related to other parts as well. The other function of right mindfulness is that the Buddha calls putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Which is one of the reasons why we have chanting before the meditation, to bring our minds away from the concerns of the world and more into the concerns of the Dharma. We start out with reflections on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. In Pali they're called sarana, which can mean refuge, but it also means something you remember, something you keep in mind. You try to keep in mind the values that they represent, the qualities that they represent. Because they represent a search for happiness, which harms nobody. And it aims high for a happiness that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. It's always good to keep that perspective in mind. Because the perspective of the world is something else. The search for happiness is basically how much money you can get so you can buy things. And on top of that, there's all the messages of the media saying that true happiness is impossible, but so find your pleasures where you can. And the Buddhist basic is saying, no, true happiness is possible, a deathless happiness is possible. Don't sell yourself short. You take the Dharma as your refuge. If you wanted to order the, the three refuges, or the three topics to keep in mind, you start with the Dharma, because the Buddha said he would, would honor the Dharma himself. And of course the Sangha honors the Buddha. So you take the Dharma as your refuge, basically doing what you're doing right now. The Buddha says, practice establishing mindfulness. It means not just being aware of what's happening, but if you notice anything unskillful is coming up in the mind, you remember to let it go. You remember what you've learned about how to let it go. If something skillful comes up, you learn to encourage it. Here again, you're learning to think in terms of that framework, the search for happiness that doesn't die. The word skillfulness relates to okay, whatever leads in that direction. Unskillful is what leads away. It causes harm, puts limits on the mind, puts limits on the happiness you can find. So keep that perspective, keep that framework in mind. Then the chants on the triple gem are then followed by the chant reflecting on the requisites. This is something the monks are supposed to do every day, to reflect on the fact that food, clothing, shelter, and medicine are things that you actually need in order to keep alive. You try to 
think about how much you really need and try not to take more than you really need. Because these things come with a price. The food we eat, even if it's vegetarian or vegan food, involves suffering for the people who have to work to farm the food, get the food here. It takes work to fix it, clean up afterwards. Clothing requires work. Shelter requires a lot of work. Medicine requires a lot of work. There's a lot of suffering that goes on in providing for these things. And when you're born with a human body, it's like you have this big gaping hole that needs to be stuffed with these things. So you have to ask yourself, okay, how do I repay those debts? Well, you repay through the practice. Then we have the five recollections, recollection on aging, illness, and death, and separation. If you stopped with those four, it would be pretty depressing. Subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. I will go different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. But then the Buddha goes on to that fifth reflection, which is a reflection on your actions. This is the way out. Because when we reflect on the Buddha, we should remind ourselves, and he showed this, that true happiness can be found through human effort. So we have to pay careful attention to what we do and we say and we think. And these things come from where? They come from our mind, so we need to train the mind. Because it does have that tendency to go for things that are going to cause trouble. That's what the next reflection was about, the four Dhamma summaries. The world is swept away. The story goes that a king had asked a monk why he had ordained. And the monk gave these four summaries. He said he'd learned these from the Buddha. And it was because of these facts of, about the world that he decided to leave home. The king had been mystified by the fact that this monk had become a monk because he came from a wealthy family. He was young, healthy. His relatives were still alive. And the king was of the opinion that people would become monks only if they were suffering from poverty, suffering from death in the family, or suffering from bad health. But the monk said no, he had these reasons. He explained them. The first one, the world is swept away. He asked the king, when you were young, were you strong? And the king says, yes. And how about now? Well, the king was 80 years old. He said, and the strength is all gone. In fact, it means to put his foot someplace and it goes someplace else. Basically, the teaching on anicca, or inconstancy. The world offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. This is a teaching on dukkha, or suffering. The example the monk gives is, he asks the king, do you have a recurring illness? And the king does, what they call wind illness. Which back in those days meant shooting pains going through the body. He says, sometimes I'm lying in my bed filled with pain. My courtiers are standing around saying, maybe he'll die this time, maybe he'll die this time. You can imagine what their motivation is. And the monk says, can you order them to share some of that pain so you don't have to feel all of it? And the king says, no, I have to feel all of it myself. That's why there's no one in charge. No one is really sovereign. The world has nothing of its own. One has to leap, pass on, leaving everything behind. Okay, this is a teaching on not-self. That whatever you have in terms of material possessions, it's not going to go with you when you die. It's not really yours. All you have is your karma. So here the king's been made to reflect on the fact of aging, illness, and death. And then the monk asks him to illustrate the principle that the world is insatiable, slave to craving. If there were a kingdom to the east that were weak but wealthy,
But you try to conquer it? The king says, yes, of course. There's a kingdom to the south that was weak and wealth, wealthy. Would you try to conquer that? Yes. Here he is, 80 years old, can't even put his foot in the right place. And still he's insatiable. How about a kingdom to the west, a kingdom to the north? Yes, yes. A kingdom on the other side of the ocean. Go for that one too. This reflection is to make you think. This is what the way the world is. These things that are in constant stressful and not self, and yet we keep coming back to them again and again and again. Because we don't think we'd find anything better. So again, this is good topics to think about before you meditate. If you're going to look for happiness out in the world, it's, it's going to get canceled. You've got to look inside. And as you look inside, then you develop those four Brahma-viharas, the sublime attitudes. You start with goodwill for yourself. If you really have goodwill for yourself, if you really want yourself to be happy, you've got to practice. Because after all, if you, our normal tendency is to go for things that age, grow ill, and die. And if we go for that, our, we really care about our true happiness. We all want to be happiness, happy, and you'd think that people would take their happiness seriously, and yet they're, they're so casual about how they think about, well, this might be good, or that might be good, or you see somebody has something and it just strikes your fancy. So we start with the principle of genuine goodwill for yourself, and then you extend it to others. You realize that in your search for happiness, if your happiness causes other people to suffer, it's not going to last. Other people will do what they can to destroy it. So you want to find happiness in a way that harms no one. Then you feel compassion for those who are suffering. This is how goodwill feels when you see someone who's suffering. You feel compassion. Empathetic joy for those who are happy. This is a test for your goodwill. You say, may all beings be happy, may all beings be happy. But then you see somebody, and if you're jealous or resentful of the happiness, okay, something's wrong. But if you can be happy for other people's happiness, even when they're doing things better than you can or they're at a higher level than you are, in terms of their wealth, health, how far they've gotten in the practice. You can be happy for them. Okay, that's, that's free happiness. Finding joy in other people's joy. But then you realize, okay, their karma is their karma, your karma is your karma. No matter how much goodwill you have for others, there's only so much you can do for them. You've got to focus on your actions. Okay, this again is how to put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. You're not distressed about other people's suffering. You're not greeting for happiness the way they have it. You realize you've got to look inside. Again, it all comes down to your actions. That's what the reflection on equanimity is all about. All beings are owners of their actions, just like you're an owner of your actions. So these are thoughts that are meant to focus you inside and to clear away a lot of the reasons you might have for letting your mind wander out to things outside. So we think about the basic principles of where true happiness lies, the people who in the past have set good examples. And we reflect on how our desire for happiness in the world leads again and again and again to disappointment. If you're going to find a happiness you can rely on, you've got to look inside, develop the qualities you have inside that the Buddha developed and the Sangha developed. As the Buddha said, it was because of his resolution, his ardency, and his heedfulness that he was able to get an awakening. Well, these are qualities we have too. Maybe not as strong as his, but 
he worked on developing them. It wasn't that he was some divine being who had these things magically. He had to work on developing these qualities. Well, he can do it, we can do it as well. That's an attitude he encourages, by the way. Some people think that it's ironic that Buddhism, with its teachings on not self, contains some of the earliest spiritual autobiographies in the world. In fact, about the earliest autobiographies, period. The Buddha's autobiography, as he describes his quest for awakening. But he's basically setting out a template. He's showing this is how it's done. This is how he came to the truth. And this is how he found the right path. And these are the results he got to encourage you to follow the same path as well. So these are reflections that are meant to bring the mind to want to settle down in the present moment, and to be disinclined to let your thoughts spread out into the world. You've got work that needs to be done right here, right now. And it's good work. Developing your mindfulness, developing your alertness, developing your ardent wish to do this skillfully. So these are thoughts that bring you to a point where you can put a lot of your thoughts about the world outside, aside, and focus on thinking about your breath, thinking about your mind as it relates to the breath right now how to breathe in a way that the mind and the breath fit together well. So you feel at home right here. When you feel at home, then it's very easy to watch what's going on in the mind. And then you follow what the Buddha says is, mindfulness is a governing principle. If there are good qualities that are not here yet, well, you give rise to them. You remember that. And if there are good qualities that aren't here, then you remember to maintain them. You don't just watch them come and go. Because after all, you do have goodwill for yourself. And this is how goodwill is expressed. By developing as much skill as you can in how you relate to your mind. Both as it ex expresses in your words and deeds outside, and also how it relates to itself. When you clear up all the ignorance that you have about your own mind here in the present moment, then you've cleared up the big problem in life. When the Buddha taught his Four Noble Truths, he wasn't just saying, here's some interesting facts you might find interesting. He's saying, this is the most important issue to deal with, how to put an end to your suffering. And this is how it's done. Because once you've put an end to the suffering that you cause for yourself, there's nothing that can weigh the mind down at all. <laughs>